Good morning. Welcome to my world. Each of you may have come out here. And uh, it's a different kind of Sunday, and that throws me off. Uh, we are on the cusp of celebrating the Reformation. Next Sunday is the official Sunday designated to uh, celebrate the beginnings of a, a, a movement that swept into Europe and, and covered the world. A spiritual renewal often declared to be the Reformation. A number of our members from this congregation were blessed to travel to Germany last spring, and uh, I, anytime somebody goes somewhere where they perhaps can bring something back to the congregation so it's a danger to travel, I say, you're going to share. I want to hear about that. I want this congregation to be blessed as well and to hear some of the insights you may have gleaned. And so thank you to those who will present today for the work they have put in. And we do hope and pray that you will be blessed as we share pictures and stories and remember uh, some of what we experienced in Germany as we saw the places where Martin Luther and others moved and lived and were inspired by the God's Holy Spirit. But we will also worship today in different ways as we always do with prayer and song. And uh, so we pray God's blessing on our time together. I invite you to let your heart be still for a moment, and then we will gather with us all. Let us come into worship together by rising and singing together. Holy, holy, holy. Congregation, please rise. Paul writes, 
Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the Church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that He has chosen you, because our message of the Gospel came to you, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak of it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks be to God. Oh man, thanks be to God. And so, I would invite those who will be a part of our presentation. Actually, first of all, I'm going to just ask Dan to come forward. We're going to give you a little bit of a slideshow. And as he's doing that, Vaughn is going to light a Reformation candle. Come all the way from Germany. It has Luther's symbol, the rose upon it, to invoke the spirit who guided Luther throughout his time and all of his ministrations. And then we invite you to sit back and enjoy this PowerPoint. I'm going to turn this light off so we can see a little better. Perhaps a familiar song that we can hear as we go forward to.
uh, of the tour that we were blessed and, and fortunate to be able to participate in. The music just doesn't want to stop. It's awesome. It's a good thing. Uh, and so each of us, uh, we hope that you will indulge us. We'd like to just share, share a little piece. Uh, we, we broke it up a little bit with some different aspects uh, of faith and different aspects of history that we want to lift before you. Uh, and so you see there, we have even a little bit of a write-up from J.R. Westfather, who some of you will have known and remembered from his time here at Trinity. He was able to come and be a part of this tour, and I'll read what he has offered to us. Uh, and so, if I can take the remote, see me how our technology works here. Um, a little bit of luck, this will work, and so I'll call out some of the pictures. I want to take you through Wittenberg, where uh, certainly it was not the beginning of Martin Luther's life, but certainly the Reformation has its roots in, this, in the town of Wittenberg, a lovely little town. And this is where it all began. Martin Luther came to Wittenberg to be a priest, a professor. He learned and began to delve into the New Testament uh, and was enlightened by the sense of God's grace and how God loved people instead of being a God of wrath. And this was the Castle Church, the big uh, foundational aspect of that town where people would gather for worship and where Prince Frederick would have gathered as well. But there was a problem. The Pope wanted to build a new place of worship in Rome and needed some funding for that to build a place where people could be inspired. And so he issued what was called indulgences. And you see here an indulgence box and this little place where they could drop a coin in there and they had a wonderful little jingle that they would say, every time a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Uh, and they would go about selling these things. And when Luther heard about this, he was incredibly incensed. He felt this was an offense to God's grace. And how could this be? And they had this great, uh, great uh, building in Wittenberg that we could go into, and it had a 360 panorama where they had used actual people to represent Wittenberg in 1517. And so there you see the stormy monk himself railing against these indulgences before the castle church as the priest is looking out, what's all the hubbub? And Luther is preaching against that. And just to give you a sense of scale, that's me standing there looking at it. There's a tower where you can go up about three stories and you can look and you can see the entire place. And it's a beautiful thing. You can probably find it online. I would encourage you to go and find a 360 panorama of Wittenberg. A beautiful thing. And there's the door itself. Well, that's not the actual door that, Witt, that Luther would have nailed his 95 theses to. I brought you the actual copy. I found them. They were sitting in a closet somewhere, and that's, uh, well, no, they're not, but it's a copy of it. The original door burned back in the 19th century, and so they have created this brass door with all of the 95 theses uh, written out on it. It's right there for everybody to come and take great pictures of. And there's still a few rabble-rousers around who still try to create issues, and you can't get at the door to post anything to it, but you can stand there with the 95 theses, and if you're real lucky, a couple of buddies will come and join you, and, uh, and who knows what grows out of that kind of a thing, as people come together around God's Word. And so, there you see Pastor J.R. Bestwater and Pastor Ron Bestwater, along with somebody who uh, shall remain nameless. Well, it wasn't enough. Luther just wanted to get the conversation going when he posted those things. He said, let's talk about this. I think there's some problems. However, a couple of his students grabbed it off the door, and a new piece of technology had been invented not long before. Social media was just kind of getting rolling. You think this is a new thing? Absolutely not. They took that, and they went to the printing press, and they printed off piles of them and sent them all over the kingdom so that others could begin to read and be inspired by what was going on in this little community of Wittenberg. And so the fire began to grow. Martin Luther was becoming a bit of a rock star. Everywhere he went, crowds would come out as he spoke about the worth of the individual in God's eyes. How not just the, the kings and the popes were great, but even the lowest was important in God's kingdom. And there you see, looking down the streets in Wittenberg, the town church, where the common person would typically gather. Luther preached regularly there. And I haven't uh, given you Luther's encouragement, but what he would say is, I preach on a Sunday morning, and then I go home and drink beer, and let God's Word do its work. Now, I don't go home and drink beer, but that's a good thought. That when we hear the Word in this place, it goes with us, and we go, and the Spirit continues to speak with us, and the Word continues to penetrate into our heart. And there you see uh, the church, St. Mary's in Wittenberg. Uh, you can go and find wonderful pictures of the interior, and, and, and Dan has many of them as well, and I would encourage you to go and find them. Life continued for Luther, and, and the Reformation began to grow. The prince supported him. Eventually, he fell in love. 
a, a former nun, Katarina Van Bora, and he got married. And when you get married, what does a prince do for you? He gives you a house. Now, that's the good old days. They don't do that anymore. But uh, they figured he's going to have a lot of kids, so they gave him a big house. And there you see, that was Luther's home, a former uh, nunnery that he got to move into, the Black Holly Cloister. And it's massive, and we've got lots of great pictures of that as well that I've encouraged you to go and find and look at. But as he grew, he had many children, and he had a wonderful whole life. He spoke very warmly of how grace and how God's love was found in the midst of family. And there, he would also invite his students and his friends to gather around the table with him. And in those conversations, people just hung on every word that Luther spoke, and they wrote it down. They transcribed it all, and I've even got some of those books called Table Talk, where Luther just talked about life and faith. What is it like to be in the marketplace and to be a Christian, to travel and be a Christian, to sell your wares and be Christian, everything, all these kind of things, inspiring stuff that people just couldn't get enough of. And this is the interior of the castle church, because eventually, like all of us, Martin Luther, a mortal man, though he strode as a giant in many ways upon his time, succumbed to his mortality. He died. He was returned to the castle church, and if you can make it out, there is the pulpit where kind of the majority of people are gathered is right below that pulpit where Martin Luther did at times proclaim God's word, and directly below that pulpit is where he is buried. There is his tombstone proclaiming Martin Luther, reformer, Christian, person of faith, uh, and because the word was so central to him, they thought, where else could he possibly be buried? right below the pulpit where the word is so often proclaimed. And even on the church itself, they made an amendment, and you probably can't make that out from here, but any of you who speak the Deutsch will know it says, Ein Festeberg, which is a mighty fortress. Perhaps his best known writing, a song that Lutherans and Christians everywhere continue to proclaim, that it is God who is our fortress, our refuge, and it is God who continues to guide his church into the future. And so thank you for taking a little quick tour through Wittenberg. There's many more things in the back you can find books to peruse, but I'm going to invite the uh, next member of our tour to come forward and, and share their portion and their comments. Hi. It's you. <laughs> My portion is going to be about the Wartburg Castle. And why did I pick the Wartburg Castle? I picked the Wartburg Castle because um, about 10, 15 years ago, I'll admit I didn't know much about the story of Martin Luther. So I kind of did the short version of it. I watched Luther, the movie. <laughs> so um, as I'm watching this intense movie about Martin Luther and his radicals, I'm like, oh, they're going to get their man. Like, it's just, I'm sure that he was going to come to a bad end. And then I was shocked to find out that his friends stole him and put him in this castle. And it was just so God. Like, if God has a purpose and a plan for you, he'll make it work out for you. So this is why I picked this castle. Uh, it was beautiful. <laughs> Oops, what did I do now? <laughs> I got it. So anyway, um, this castle has a lot of history. So I'm not going to give you all the history of the castle. Okay, there it is. Okay, so this castle was first founded um, in about 1067, is what I found out. It's 410 meters high. Um, we actually walked up it. Well, the bus can only travel up so far. And then you could wait for a little van, like things to take you up if you needed to, if there was a mobility issue. But um, a bunch of us actually took the stairs. It was the best workout that I had on that trip. Uh, so where Bob is standing by that uh, card, that's kind of what they, a replica of what they would have put Martin Luther in and taken him up there. So they took him up there, they captured him, oh, well after the, uh, he was banned after the Diet of Worms, he went there to um, discuss his uh, 95 thesis stuff. So he was captured on May 4th of uh, 1521 and he didn't leave there. He was there for 10 months. He left March 1st of 1522. Um, and they had given him, um, um, like, they, they changed his name, they changed his appearance to kind of hide him in the castle, because there was people in the castle. So his name was uh, Junker Jor, is that? 
you can, it's wise, it's supposed to be wise, isn't it? Anyway. <laughs> uh, and while he was there, uh, he took the original Greek of the New Testament and turned it into German language. So that was the first common language of the people that the people that could actually read the New Testament. Um, okay, why did I put an arrow there? <laughs> um, when we were touring in there, um, it was quite busy. There was, on our whole trip, we had run across about two or three different choirs. This particular day, there was an Asian group of about 20 people that were a touring choir. And they were right in that area there, in the amphitheater kind of thing, the sound of it was just beautiful. And uh, this group was singing a cappella, they were singing, God is so good. And it was just so moving. So, that's cool. It's it was beautiful. Okay, we couldn't take pictures in the interior of that, so I got these off the internet. But we did see this, and it's quite impressive. Yeah. And the only other thing I have here to tell you is in 1999, this castle became a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And that's my part. my presentation on the Bach House, um, Bach, so John, Johan, Johan Sebastian Bach. So on day nine of our trip, uh, we stopped at Eisenach, and this Luther's hometown quoted. Uh, it was here where we visit the Bach House Museum, which is dedicated to composer Johann Sebastian Bach. And uh, this museum attracts many tourists and enthusiasts from all around the world. And here we're able to see exhibits of his compositions and uh, also on display. Are many of the finest instruments. Here's some like organs that we're able to see. There's a statue. Uh, yeah, here, here's some pictures. And uh, yeah, the, plus to top it all off, we had a demonstration of some light organs, as you can see, uh, which they played for us and with the help of uh, Dave Best Father at the football. Then after we had a chance, just to sit back and relax in these sound booths, just to listen to, to his work of, and his pieces. He could, he could literally spend hours, if not days, experience what he had all of the museum had to offer. So yeah, it was a, it was a good day. Pastor Yard, it was a good day. <laughs> so, uh, with Sebastian Bach, I lost my notes here. Now, with us, Sebastian Bach, his involvement in the Red uh, Reformation was about 150 to 200 years after Martin Luther's time. Uh, and he became a composer musician, much like many members of his family. And uh, he believed his work had two purposes. Uh, one, to, glorif to glorification of God, and two, the refreshment of his spirit. His, and his composition, compositions expressed just that. He was using many of these fine instruments along with the pipe organ. And it's pipe organ and space line, plus the harmonies of the choir, and, and having uh, Martin Luther as his big, biggest influence. Uh, so, yeah, he was able to accomplish this, that closeness with God through, through music. 
and in Luther's time, really, it wasn't played like the way played that out in the church. So I'm sure, yeah, it would, it would have been pleasing for Luther to hear this. For two, he believed music was another way to connect with God, along with the Word of God. And that's. This isn't so much a history, my few slides that I have, it was more just thoughts that I had as we were touring. We started off in Berlin, ended up in, in Prague, and in the middle of, of the, the tour, obviously, were most of the, um, uh, the Martin Luther uh, pieces or the places to visit, museums and things. But we also um, visited Buchenwald. And the one thing about being in Berlin is that you can't help but visit and know that it once was divided. It was East Germany and there was a West German side. And um, although we had pictures of the wall, um, it, and pictures of it coming down uh, in our time, um, there were still a lot of remnants of that divis divisiveness or division. Um, there was also a lot of examples of it coming together as a, as a city and as a country. Um, but it was very hard to get away from the impact of World War II on that particular area of the world. And so that had, had a big um, influence on me um, as we were going through because Buchenwald came somewhere in the middle of the journey and yet Berlin was at the beginning of the journey and, and all the way through there were examples of, you know, where wars had been fought in Dresden. We saw um, some of the rebuilding that had happened as a result of uh, World War II bombing. And it was uh, the one thing that I guess I, I I felt about that was that in all the times that we've lived in, even in Luther's time, there was fighting, there was rebels against the uh, aristocracy, and there was fighting, and there was still, like even in our in our parents' time and in our time now, there still is hatred going on and, and fighting. And it's, um, the whole thing about is, uh, do we ever learn from any, <laughs> any of this? And hopefully, at some at some point, um, we do. But um, it was just more of a thought that I had as we were going through there, and it was. Um, we had moments of great joy, and certainly the music was was amazing throughout the whole journey. But it was also that kind of that undercurrent of how fragile man is, and how very human man is, and how we get ourselves into trouble all the time when we look away from God. Um, this was part of Martin Luther's words, and. During the time that we were there, Dan and I traveled to the south of Germany, and in the north of Germany, it was actually quite different. It was very much more um, uh, farm, it was very much more pastoral. Uh, the, the, the touring that we did and the traveling by bus, there weren't as many you know, big cities, not so much in the way of subway trains and, and things like that. And um, everywhere that we looked, there was always something of nature. And Martin Luther was a great appreciator of nature, and he said it's not only in, in the word, that you see God's creation. It's in everything, in the flowers, the, cl the clouds, the stars. And, um, and that actually spoke to me as well. And the talk about where, it is, where do you place faith in your, in your life? And uh, this tree is not an apple tree, but it's uh, the idea is even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. And that was, Kind of a definition or a way uh, that he looked at his thing. Um, one of the things um, uh, we have company today that were also on our trip, they're from Lumsden, not part of the Trinity Con Congregation, but they were with us on our trip. And um, uh, Barry brought a, a, a United Church Observer magazine that has a story about Luther. It's actually the same journey that we went on, and it's with Pastor Mark's uh, uh, material at the back. And one of the, the things that is spoken, and it's a, a little bit saying, he talked about word being for the intellect and song being for the soul. And another thing I learned from the article um, was that he was actually behind, Luther was behind the whole beginning of congregational singing. Because prior to Luther, 
that was also something that the congregation just didn't do. They, you know, they didn't, they couldn't read, they couldn't read the hymnals, etc. So it was done by people of the church that even did the singing. And so Martin Luther made that certainly more available to, to everybody, that whole idea of the singing. And he did talk about faith and love, and he connected them quite uh, quite well. There's many um, examples of faith, hope, and love and where that fits. Many people, when they're getting married, choose the, that uh, particular ver verse out of Corinthians about where, where faith, the greatest of all of these, is, is love. Um, and he talked about that. Faith brings the person to God, and love brings the person to people. And again, that was something that he concentrated a lot. Certainly there was a relationship with God, but there was also the relationship to your spouse, to family, to other people, and that seemed to um, open up um, religion and God to everybody. And um, when he uh, when he took that that stance, it just spoke to the people. Um, certainly, the printing press had its uh, its place and, and helped the word, but it just struck me again. There were people that talked about what Luther talked about before Luther's time, and they were burned at the stake. They were killed. So the planets aligned. Luther was a strong man, he was a strong orator, he was a force certainly to be reckoned with, um, but he was only human. And in some of the later years, um, in World War II, for example, Hitler used some of um, what Luther had written about the Jews to um, support the notion of extermination of the Jews. And so when you look at Luther, he was a great man, he did wonderful things, but he was only human. And that was something also that came through. And that was actually something Pastor Mark had said um, on the trip. He was only human. So um, I think I'm, I'm done with that. And um, it's the best fathers. And I think Mark's going to bring a message from J.L. <laughs>
the uh, our group, our travel group, who were who made the trip a lot of fun. Um, so um, my presentation will be uh, some brief thoughts about what I confirmed and I learned, at, at least in my own mind, about Martin Luther. The man. Okay, so I'll just run through a series of, of um, characteristics or uh, thoughts that I had about Martin Luther as, as a person and a couple of quotes uh, that support that. So he was uh, definitely a devout spiritual and prayerful man. And the quote that I included here, prayer is a strong wall and fortress of the church. It is a goodly Christian weapon. He's also a believer in the power of music in the church. Uh, and the quote I've included, next to the word of God, the noble art of music is the greatest treasure in the world. And that's a, a painting, a rendition of him and his family uh, in his home in Whitbury. Uh, he's also a reformer, of course. That's the whole idea behind the Reformation uh, celebration. Uh, he improved the church by challenging it. And the quote that I've included, from the beginning of my Reformation, I've asked God to send me neither dreams, nor visions, nor angels, but to give me the right understanding of his word, the Holy Scriptures, for as long as I have God's word, I know that I am walking in his way, and that I shall not fall into any error or delusion. He's also a family man, as we heard several uh, quotes uh, prior to this. Um, and some quotes from Luther include, there is no lovelier thing than a woman's love for those who are granted it. And more luck, more children. Or more children, more luck, sorry. <laughs> Luther and his wife, Katharina, had six children, three, three girls and three boys. And that's a painting of both Martin Luther and Katharina. And he's also a sinner, just like the rest of us. At the beginning of his career, Martin Luther was sympathetic to the Jewish resistance to the Catholic Church. However, he expected the Jews to convert to his purified Christianity, and when they did not, he turned against them. Oops. And probably the number one thing that I learned about Martin Luther, and I'm very pleased to report, uh, he is the founder of a great Lutheran tradition, beer drinking. Um, and the quote that uh, I found uh, regarding his thoughts about beer drinking, whoever drinks beer, he is quick to sleep. Whoever sleeps long does not sin. Whoever does not sin enters heaven. Thus, let us drink beer. <laughs> how, how can you argue with that much? And that, that actually is a photo of, of one of Martin Luther's actual beer stocks. So we preserve some real history there. <laughs> That's all I have. Thank you. I'll invite Vince to come forward again as we reset and move into the, the second portion of our worship service. Once again, thank you so much for being here, for, for prayerfully supporting uh, those who were able to be a part of that tour. Uh, it was a blessing in so very many ways to see firsthand some of these locations. I don't know, there is something to walking in the footsteps of some of these individuals who have guided the church and, and to be inspired by that. Uh, but to know that even in this place, we can be inspired and we can rejoice in God's word, which our hymn of the day is going to proclaim, as we call that up. Uh, it is to the tune that we all know so very well. Martin Luther was a wonderful songwriter, both of the music and the lyrics. So the title may not be familiar to this one, God's Word is Our Great Heritage, but you will know the tune as soon as we begin to sing it. And so please rise and we join together. God's Word is Our Great Heritage.
seated. You've heard a lot about Luther from those who uh, were part of the tour, and I appreciate them uh, putting together the time and the energy and the inspiration to craft what, uh, what they have presented to you. After the service, you're welcome to peruse some of the materials that are there at the back and consider some of the ways that Luther has inspired generations over the last 500 years. But I thought it would be appropriate for us to hear from Martin Luther himself. Now, I'm not going to give you the entirety of one of his sermons because they could last for hours. Uh, this is a snippet taken from a gospel, uh, John 15, and the sermon that Martin, that Martin Luther wrote about that. John 15, I mean, many of you will remember, is Jesus saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. And this is a little bit of Martin Luther's reflection upon what does that mean when Jesus says that and what does it mean to me. He says, when I am converted by the gospel, the Holy Spirit is present. He takes me as clay and makes of me a new creation, which is endowed with a completely different mind, heart, and thoughts. That is to say, with a true knowledge of God and a sincere trust in God's grace. To summarize, the very essence of my heart is renewed and changed. Therefore, I become a new plant, one that is grafted on Christ the vine and will grow only from Him. My holiness, my righteousness, my purity do not stem from me, nor do they depend upon me. They come solely from Christ and are based only in Him. I am rooted by faith in Him, just as the sap will flow from the stalk and into the branches on a real tree. Now I am like Him, and I am of His kind. Both He and I become one nature, one essence. I can bear fruit in Him and through Him. The fruit is not mine, it is only the vines. Thus Christ and the Christian become one loaf, one body, so that the Christian can bear good fruit. Not Adam's fruit, nor his own fruit, but Christ's. Therefore, when a Christian baptizes, or preaches, or consoles, or exhorts, or works, or suffers, they do not do it as a man descended from Adam. It is Christ who does this within them. The lips and the tongue with which he proclaims and confesses God's words are not even his. They are Christ's lips and tongues. The hands with which he works and serves his neighbor are the hands of Christ. As he says, Jesus is in him, and he is in Christ. These words, he who abides in me and I in him, from John 15, verse 5, Christ wants us to understand that Christianity is not brought in from without. It is not put on like a garment, nor does it consist in the adoption of a new way of living, like monasticism or self-chosen sanctity. It is a new birth that can be brought about only by God's word and spirit. There must be an entirely new man from the bottom of their heart. Then, however, when the heart is born anew in Christ, fruits will fat follow naturally. These fruits will be the confession of the gospel, works of love, obedience, and patience. Here ends that sermon. You are getting a full dose of Martin Luther in advance of the celebration of 500 years. Uh, so for the confession of our faith, it's a little different. I'm going to invite you to remain seated for this. I hope that you will be able to see the, uh, the uh, overhead here, because we're going to speak together not only those ancient words of the Apostles' Creed, but some of you, this will take you back to confirmation. Martin Luther's explanation. What does this mean when we say, I believe? These are Luther's words and the ways in which he would encourage us to understand the confession of our faith. So let us join together, confessing these words and Martin Luther's explanation. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all dangers and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness to see. For all this it is my duty to thanks and praise 
serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seats at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, the true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy and precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord, or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, He calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies a whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Amen. Luther understood that we respond to the call of the gospel, and one of those responses is through our stewardship. So I invite us to praise God now through the collection of our offering. I invite our ushers, our collectors, to come forward.
And the fellowship of believers is calling us to be reshaped into the image of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us with that. Send your spirit again and again upon your holy church so that in each age and in each day we might hear the call and find new ways to live out your gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for those who are called to be leaders in the church, and we pray your blessing upon them, that they would be inspired by your Holy Spirit, that they would be guided, that they would be courageous, that they would be prepared to take a stand, as Luther did, to understand what your truth is revealed in Jesus Christ, that yours is the way of grace and forgiveness and reconciliation, new life and new ways of treating one another. Help us with these tasks, for we cannot do it on our own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, for each person who belongs to this place of worship, for new friends, old friends, for people who support the work of ministry that we undertake, we give you thanks, and we pray that you would bless us abundantly. Help us to rejoice in the blessings we already have, and help us to look forward for the ways in which you will continue to guide and direct. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we give you thanks, for we know that you are a healing God. You are one who invites us to place ourselves in your loving hands and to know that you will provide as you know is best. Help us above all to trust that. And now as we proclaim before you silently and aloud, we pray that you would receive the prayers of our hearts and the people and situations that we lift to you. As again, we say them either silently or aloud. challenged by mobility and health issues, who struggle to sometimes feel that they are part of the community of Jesus, we pray that your spirit would rest upon them, encouraging them and helping them, uh, and may they know that they belong to this body of Christ. For your world, for the care of creation, for the stewardship of relationships that we uh, are invited to be a part of, we pray your grace and your strength. And as we come to the celebration of 500 years since the Reformation, we, we look back and we rejoice in the ways in which you have guided your congregation, but remind us that you always guide. You have a future prepared for us. And uh, help us to remember that it really it was a nobody from a little podunk town in the middle of Germany who set the church on fire. And that so often that's the way you work. A carpenter from Nazareth who bears your presence in the world is never the same. Help us to remember there is nothing that you cannot do when we place ourselves in your hands. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, we entrust to you now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, I invite you to enter into the blessing of God. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. This time I would invite the community to be seated and uh, I would ask if there are announcements to be lifted up. Sky, we have a case of the So after last week's vote, we met with the demolition company and the plan is sometime during November. We don't have a date set right now, but uh, his schedule is looking into it and seeing what his timeline is. So sometime in November. So that means if you have something inside that you want before it's uh, gone, you should probably grab it before they knock it down. It'll be way better shape now than they are. Um, so with that though, gas is getting shut off probably within the next week. Um, and then the, the demolition company wants to get the asbestos removal through in while we still have power. 
So they're going to remove the asbestos, and then after that, then we'll shut the power off, and then after that, then we'll shut the when it can commence. So we're still ironing out all the details and timelines, but when I met with them last week, they seemed to be up and up with all the questions that the council had for them. So, um, yeah, that's kind of a, an update. So if you've got stuff and don't want it smashed, get it soon. There it is, in a nutshell. Thank you. To the point. Thank you for all those who have participated in that process and continue as we move forward. Uh, Does anybody want any special groups to start for to you know help with keeping our congregation healthy? Um, does anybody want any special presentations made for the for the congregation and the community? Um, please come see me or Pastor Mark, and we will see about maybe getting stuff going here to make our congregation healthier. Thank you. So just to put that up once again, and I think also you could talk to Barb or Alice or Yvonne who are part of the health cabinet, also helping to encourage and, and guide Myrna as she grows in that, her training as a parish nurse. But there are things, health is more than just your body. God has created us as mind, body, spirit, unity, and all things are infected by so many different things. If you are experiencing an affliction of some sort, let Myrna know and she will come and perhaps uh, help you through that in some different way. So, if you have anything you want to learn more about, talk to her or myself or the health cabinet, and we'll do a presentation. Okay? God bless you, Myrna, as you continue to grow that ministry. There's a number on the back of you. Oh, you have one too? Later this week, and Mr. Rowe as well. So let's wish them happy birthday. 